Good morning. If everyone wants to uh, take their seats, we'll get started in a moment. Welcome to our fiction stage. I think one of the finest of this wonderful National Book Festival. My name is Peter Vankovich. I have been fiction manager for many years, but I worked 30 years at the Library of Congress, and I'm the la last standing person being a volunteer for every one of them. So I'm very. One of my proudest accomplishments, I live in North Carolina, this is my homecoming weekend here. So we're gonna have a wonderful day here. This is the best part and we've got some fantastic writers. I do wanna introduce Maria Rana, my good friend. She's the literary director for the National Book Festival and welcome. Thank you, and welcome to all of you. This is, a, this is a grand occasion every year. The Library of Congress puts on a very big show for you. I hope uh, you have a chance to go down. We're very grateful to our sponsors and our donors, and I hope you have a chance to go down to the expo floor and thank them personally, because uh, you're able to come to this wonderful free event because of their generosity. And uh, really, no amount is too small. If you're willing to give, uh, to the Library of Congress's National Book Festival, please, I invite you to do so. Uh, we love your support, and we love to see your faces here every year. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. It's a great lineup this year. Uh, I always think that every year it's the best it could possibly be, and then it gets better. So, uh, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Dr. Hayden was sworn in as the 14th Librarian of Congress on September 14, 2016. She was nominated by President Barack Obama, and she came to the Library of Congress from the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore. Wonderful library, if you don't, yes. Pratt. where she was for 23 years, the CEO. So um, she is, I don't think it's been, uh, it's probably 100 years since we've had a li librarian be the librarian of Congress. So we're very proud. One of uh, Dr. Hayden's primary goals is to make the Library of Congress accessible to all Americans through its website, check it out, loc.gov. Uh, through its exhibitions and reading rooms, we invite you to come. It's a public place. It is your library. So, um, and with grand events such as the National Book Festival, please welcome our very wonderful Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the National Book Festival, my favorite event of the year. The fiction authors being brought to you through the generosity of the library's James Madison Council uh, really brings this to life. And they have been a sponsor of the festival for the entire 18 years. I also have to say that I share Marie's excitement about the wonderful lineup of authors on this stage and all the others. While you're here, I hope you make it down to the lower level where there are many fun, family-friendly activities devoting, devoted to bringing you and young people more from the Library of Congress. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Now, I have to also tell you that I am super excited, and so you will probably see me throughout the day running around. I wore this top especially so just wave, because as a librarian, this is like being in heaven. <laughs> Books, authors, poets, illustrators, authors, it's just, I'm a quiver. So that's why I have to make sure that I write down all of my remarks, because I can get distracted. And I know you will too, so this is wonderful. And I'm very pleased to be able, though, uh, to be, to present something today that is very dear to my heart. Since 2008, the Library of Congress has honored great writers of fiction. 
from John Gresham to Toni Morrison to Marianne Robinson, Dennis Johnson, and this award recognizes the best writers of fiction. And the winners are chosen by a distinguished panel of Nobel and Man Booker Prize winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, and other literary award recipients, as well as past winners of the prize. And this year, to my personal delight as well, the panel has selected Miss Annie Pru. Now, Ms. Pru has received just about every literary award there is, the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, and the O. Henry Award, among many others. She is the author of eight books, including The Shipping News and the short story Brokeback Mountain, both of which were adapted into major motion pictures, and her latest book is Barkskins. She is truly an American original. She has given us monumental sagas and keen-eyed, skillfully wrought stories. And throughout her writing, she succeeds in capturing the wild, woolly heart of America from its screwball wit <laughs> to every last detail. She is so deserving of this award. And we are about to confer to Miss Pru. Will you please come forward and accept the 2018 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. Please join me in welcoming a true American treasure, Ms. Annie Pru. Thank you all so much for coming. It's wonderful, wonderful to see so many pals out there. <laughs> and I do think of readers as friends. And I've had the great pleasure of meeting people everywhere who like the things I write about, who have stories of their own. And once in a while, I get a real big surprise. One time in Australia, after I had been reading, a lady handed me in the book signing line a little note folded over. And she looked very sorrowful as she handed it to me. I didn't have a chance to open it until later. And when I did open it, it was about two sentences of a very hard story. She said that she had hated her husband all the years she'd been married to him. And the only surcease that she had from her misery was reading. And I found that extremely poignant. And it's troubled me to this day to think that her only escape from what was an unhappy situation was reading. But reading can do that to us. It can do that for us. And I know this is an audience of readers, and I share that with you. We're all readers here. I'm so pleased to be here, and thank you. Thank you very much for coming.
It's such a pleasure to be here with Annie Pru, one of, I am uh, a devoted, loyal fan for many years, have writ, read every single book that she's written uh, from the very beginning. It's extraordinary. I think, I said to her last night, I think you're the great chronicler of North America. She's done the range, um, and I don't mean just the Wyoming range. <laughs> I mean, she's done Newfoundland, she's done Canada, she's done Wyoming. There is this tremendous uh, cavalcade of characters that she has brought to us. Her stories can be raw, they always hit you in the gut. Uh, they are really an extraordinary um, collection of American, North American, uh, beautiful, uh, beautifully written works. Um, I am so pleased that you have received this prize, Annie. Congratulations from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and thank you for that anecdote, because reading is, uh, in many ways, an, es uh, an escape. You gave us a good last night at the pep rally, because we have a pep rally. We, we call it the gala, where authors all get together and they uh, talk about what inspired them and what put their heads together, in a way. And you gave the most extraordinary uh, sort of litany of works that had, from the very beginning, uh, that had informed you. Um, could you sort of give a short version to uh, our audience here? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the message that I was trying to get across, much condensed, is you can never introduce your child to reading too early. When you get home from the hospital, or even before the baby is born, Read, read out loud. It may sound silly, but it's not. And as soon as you do get home from the hospital with that new kid, pick up a book, preferably one with pictures, even though those little eyes aren't really focused yet, and read. Start reading and repeat this recipe every day until the child says, I want to read by myself and you will have a smart, intelligent, involved, terrific person in your life. You have to start young. Don't wait until the kid is six or seven or eight or 10. Right away, as tiny infants, introduce them to books. That's what I said. That's, that's, yeah, that's exactly what she said. And um, I, your background, I think, predisposes you to, um, to really know North America so well. Uh, you have Anglo-American and French-Canadian backgrounds, and your father was from Quebec, and your mother was a painter. Uh, and and uh, that, in many ways, I think, uh, seeing, because your, your, your books, your, your short stories are so vividly drawn. There's a very painterly quality. Did you paint as a child? We all grew up with pencils and brushes in our family. Um, it, was just, uh, it was just what we did. I think our parents were not happily married. I'm the oldest of five girls. I think our parents were not really happy with one another, and my mother took refuge in painting. I've seen some of her paintings from before she met my father, and they're joyous and with very strong colors. <laughs> <laughs> and then as years went by, the paintings became smaller and tighter and um, almost always landscape. People began to disappear from her work. But um, she had uh, a storytelling talent, like her mother before her, something about women and stories. Um, and she could, and often did, we'd be sitting outside and she'd motion to the ground and we'd notice some ants down there. And she would pick out uh, discernible ants, like one with a particularly large crumb um, would identify the crumb and that particular ant it quickly had a name attached. And this went on with uh, everything around so that we had stories just boiling up from the ground. And she just did this as a matter of course. 
If the wind was blowing the leaves a certain way, there was an animistic touch to this. There was a story that came out of it. So we were very much in the bosom of nature during my childhood, which was a wonderful thing. She was an amateur naturalist and noticed everything. We had a house full of pressed rose petals and um, animal skins and butterfly cocoons. And it made for a rich childhood in addition to reading. This was in Connecticut. It that was in were. Connecticut, but not just Connecticut. My father was, uh, my father left school at age 14, um, not by choice, and went to work in the textile mills of New England as a bobbin boy. And his ambition was to make something of himself. He felt very keenly being a French Canadian at a time when French Canadians were disliked and despised as being unwelcome immigrants. It didn't matter that his grandparents had been born in, in New England. Um, anyway, he uh, set out to improve himself. And that affected our home lives very much. We moved. He was constantly after the better job, um, went to night school, read and read and read and taught himself. And we moved and we moved and we moved and we moved. And I think by the time I left um, home, I had lived in maybe 20 places. And I've continued this in my life. I think I've moved maybe 40 times <laughs> in my life. Most recently, within the last five years, I've moved four times. <laughs> There's a big problem with this because um, <laughs> as a reader, I have a lot of books. <laughs> And even though I have um, shed myself of many of them from time to time, I tend, when I'm doing research on a particular facet of life or history, to collect all sorts of books about that period, time, people, place, and so forth. So I've had to divest myself over and over again and um, to make the load of moving lighter. Hundreds of boxes of books and I lifted every one of them with bad results. <laughs> um, but now I have to replace the ones I've lost because I miss them so badly. <laughs> I'm not one who lets go of books easily and it's, it's very embarrassing privately to want a particular book and not have it and, ha and I knew I had it. I knew where it was four houses ago. But, uh, <laughs> So that's, that's my life, um, getting more books and replacing the ones I've gotten rid of and repeating this over and over. That's the, that's the challenging part, of course, of, of, of moving. But travel seems to feed you in a way. Um, I've done a lot of that. You have. <laughs> a lot of traveling. I, I really do have itchy feet, I think. I'm, I'm always looking for the, the right place, the place I really belong. Um, but I guess in the end it boils down, I probably belong in New England, although I live just about the opposite of that. I'm in the uh, Northwest Pacific corner, and New England's far away. <laughs> but New England is not something you can escape from. For those of you who know New England, it's with you right to the end. The, one, the, the, the travel part is important, I think, in, at least in my mind as a reader, as your reader, because uh, in, in the shipping news, the language that is used is so, I mean, one can hear uh, the, that sort of Northeast uh, uh, pander, but this is sort of the, 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 the language that is used, you, the way that a Northeasterner will drop the subject or the pronoun in a sentence, and uh, you, I feel, you feel that you are in Newfoundland, and you are a part of these, uh, this community. And in Wyoming, I, 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 my grandparents were in Wyoming. I visited Wyoming as a child. Uh, from very far away, and uh, the uh, when I read your Wyoming stories, these this, these are my cousins, my uncles, my aunts. I mean, the, the lingo that you manage to capture is extraordinary. Well, that's what I do. 
Right. Um, <laughs> you sure do. You sure do. <laughs> um, my great interest is in place. I am quite fascinated by the geography, geology, the climate, the weather, the ancient history, all of the things about a place. If it's a small place, fine, but I try to find out everything I can about it. Who's been there before? Um, what was before anybody? And put them all together because I strongly believe that place makes us what we are. It's extremely difficult to escape from your place. Lots of people try it and very few succeed entirely. Uh, so the mores, the accents, the, the climate, the weather, everything that you grew up with is stuck in there. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the measurement for anything that comes afterwards, which is why I think so many of us are having trouble with climate change. It can't be right. It has to be like it was. <laughs> So, uh, and it's not. Indeed. So this examination of place is for me the main reason for writing stories. I try in the writing to understand what made this place like it is and what are the problems of the people who live there and how do they solve them. And that's my recipe for story writing. Yeah. And it's, it's a deep spelunking into the culture that you do. Let me take you back to the 70s, um, which was when, <laughs> just let's, speaking of spelunking, um, you began your, your career by writing nonfiction, and you actually founded a newspaper in Vermont. Um, oh, it wasn't fiction. <laughs> no. <laughs> We could, we, could, we could go off on that one. Uh, uh. <laughs> but at the time, you were and, you know, skiing, canoeing, hunting, fishing, all of these wonderful outdoor things. Right. Uh, and uh, you were doing how-to books on gardening and... Um, Madness. And making cider and all of that uh, wonderful sort of lifestyle. How... how um, and you... I think began a PhD in history, which you uh, decided to abandon. But the, all of these things fed in some way what you eventually did in fiction. Yes, absolutely. Tell us about that. Uh, I've had learned people commiserate with me for not finishing the degree, but it was the smartest thing I ever did. Uh, <laughs> the academic life for me, it would have been a prison. I don't like to be pinned into a, into a corner, um, which is probably why I've been married so many times. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I don't know. This stuff is hard to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did do all those things, and this little newspaper started as a joke, it was called Behind the Times. <laughs> it was a small town in Vermont, and a friend and I learned that the selectmen were having secret meetings, supposed to be public, but weren't. And so um, we took turns in actually appearing there and defying them to have a meeting without a member of the public. We wrote about it. We wrote about the selectmen's meetings at length. They got used to it, although they were very upset and angry at first. And um, to get this paper off the ground, we called together a bunch of friends and interested persons and put a note up on the general store counter that we wanted to start a newspaper and would everybody come together and we'd talk about it. So the town folks turned out. And Vermont is one of the few places left in this country where town meetings are really, really important. And the whole town comes together just like the Norman Rockwell cover, and people stand up and speak their piece and uh, sit down again and are drowned out by shouts. But, <laughs> but um, it's something to admire and wonderful to live through. So our paper got off to a flying start, and we ran it for several years, my friend Tom Watkin and I. 
Um, eventually, I went on to different things. I started moving and writing fiction, and he sold the paper, and it soon disappeared from the surface of the earth. Um, I don't know the history of what happened. I think the fellow who bought it filled it full of political tripe, and that's what happens. <laughs> But we had a good thing going, and while we did it, it was a lot of fun. So citizen science is another thing that's very dear to me, um, and I see the newspaper adventure as a kind of citizen science. Mm -hmm. As citizens, we have a tremendous amount of power if we take it. But if we just sit there and wait for the next guy to do it, it doesn't get done. Indeed. How did you, uh, you going from this sort of nonfiction uh, introduction, the, the, you, you were, if I may say, of a good age when you started writing fiction. Yes. You had had some life behind you. How did you make that decision to suddenly write uh, through the, the imagined? I don't believe it really was a decision. It just happened, as most things in life do. Um, not one of those people who wake up one morning and say, by God, I'm going to do such and such. That's nice, but it didn't happen to me. I just started writing. Um, I had been a reader forever and ever, and it was just natural. I think at one point I picked up some terribly popular new novel and read about 30 pages and thought, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Put it aside. Um, I don't remember what it was now, if it had its day, and then it's night. Um, but, <laughs> but I just started writing, and I found it to be engrossing. I saw it as uh, working out of puzzles, and it's still that for me. To write is to examine a place and the people in it, the people who might be in it, because I never use real people as models. I always use um, names from the past or invented names or just completely make people up who are composites of characteristics, attitudes, swaggers, head scratching. And this kind of thing is very fun. And if you haven't tried it, I suggest that someday when you have a little free time, sit down and invent a world that you know, it's, it's really very engaging. You began with stories. Heart Songs was your first book. That was 1988. And then you moved on to Postcards very quickly, because that was published in 1992. Mm. Uh, very well received, wonderfully received. Um, and then very shortly thereupon came the shipping news. Um, uh, and I just want to read one of the, from, from one of the reviews, which is really, I think, wraps it up nicely. Uh, the writing is charged with sardonic wit, alive, funny, a little threatening, packed with brilliantly original images, and now and then a sentence that simply takes your breath away. So true. Um, and the, the shipping news came so quickly after postcards. Was this something that you were holding in your back pocket or in a drawer somewhere that you had written <laughs> early? And uh, how did no, that happen? I, I, I had been thinking about it. My old newspaper friend, Tom Watkin, and I went on a fishing trip. We both liked fishing. And I had wanted to go to Newfoundland for years. I did graduate studies at the at, um, Sir George Williams University in Montreal, and uh, at the time, Newfie jokes were just rife. They were like the Polish jokes had been in this country, and I can't remember when, the 50s or something or other, and, and the, uh, the ditzy blonde jokes. So I was curious about Newfoundlanders, and so Tom and I decided to go fishing up there. And away we went, we headed for Newfoundland and decided to camp out all the way. Brought a canoe along with us, which was silly, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I fell in love with the place as we were just sliding into Porta Basque. There's a long ferry crossing from Nova Scotia over to Newfoundland. It's about a seven hour ferry ride and just as we came into the harbor, everything was covered with a deep green moss and it was, it was foggy and there was a foghorn going and there was a bell clanging in the distance and it was just exquisite and salty and unknown. And I just thought this is a place and I determined to learn more about it. So that was the beginning of that mm -hmm. book. Um, I went back 10 times over the next two or three years, um, gathering material, listening to people talk, um, eating the food, staying in different places, and there are lots of stories connected with that which are still untold. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it was a grand place, and I loved it deeply and still do. You captured it beautifully. You won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award for that book. I should mention also for Postcards, which was her first novel, she was the first, you were the first woman, I believe, to, uh, to win the Penn Faulkner Award. I was so lucky. <laughs> I was really lucky, yes. I think I just happened to be at a certain age, at a certain time, and things just fell into place. So um, it, it, it was good fortune for me, really good fortune. Postcards has a very powerfully sad ending. Shipping news does not. It has a powerful, sort of happy ending, as in a way. Sometimes well, you can't avoid happy endings. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote. That is a quote. <laughs> I am writing that down. <laughs> you moved to Wyoming, uh, I think it was in the late 90s or, or so. Uh, yes. That must have been a, quite a change, well, yes. certainly a change of landscape, uh, from all yeah. that moss to mm -hmm. all that prairie. Yes. How did it go? Well, uh, it was actually when I was working on postcards, I needed, um, I needed a place that was Western for my peripatetic protagonist. And I looked in the, uh, the guide to writers' residencies around the country, and lo and behold, there was one in Wyoming. I'd never even been in Wyoming, but it sounded very promising. So I wrote to them and got particulars and made an application and they said, come on out. So one day in, uh, I think it was February, I threw all my stuff in the back of my old truck in Vermont and headed west. And as I crossed the line from Nebraska, from one of the Dakotas into, into Wyoming, um, there had been a light skiff of snow the night before and it was late afternoon, that is about 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, and I saw the landscape was a color I had never, ever seen in my life. The yellow grass under the snow, the way the light was hitting, this very light, fluffy, dry snow, made everything have a kind of glistening, mauve, purplish color that was ethereal and bizarre at the same time, a color I'd never seen. What kind of a place is this that can make colors that you've never seen before? Because I was, you know, I was certainly not young and I thought I'd seen all the colors in the world, ha. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, was, I was enchanted right off the bat and spent a couple of weeks there working on my story for, uh, What was the name of that book? <laughs> <laughs> for, for Wyoming Story, the, the no, Bad no, Dirt, or? No, no, not the Wyoming Stories, the... Uh, bad Dirt, or, or the, uh, Find Just the Way It Is, or? <laughs> postcards, thank you. Post oh, postcards. <laughs> yeah. 
so I was able I was able to get the information I needed for postcards. But by then, I realized that Wyoming was a place that I should spend some time in. I walked a great deal while I was there, and it's uh, walking is an important component of writing because if you're tied up with knots about plot directions or uh, character exposés or the way things are coming together, walking usually solves the problem. The rougher the terrain, uh, um, the easier the problems are to solve. And I did a lot of walking there, and I decided that I would move to Wyoming. Um, my mother had recently died. I packed up. I moved um, and have been out of ever since. But I had 19 years of champagne powder in Wyoming. I was an avid cross-country skier for many years, and it, w it was the best. Um, I will take your suggestion on the walking. For me, it's cooking. Cooking really? seems, to, seems to get the gears spinning. Oh my god, so I've never tried that. Try, try it. <laughs> <laughs> Wyoming was very fertile ground for you. Um, I mentioned some of the books, Bad Dirt, Find Just the Way It Is, uh, Wyoming Stories. Uh, wonderful, every single one of them. And, and I actually reviewed Bird Cloud, which was your book, returning to nonfiction, actually, to write about yes. your travails of uh, the household business of living in Wyoming and, and being snowed in and all of that. Uh, and, and the tribulations with the fixing things around the house. It was really a really nitty-gritty mm. description of life in Wyoming. I miss it very much, yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm not there anymore, um, but it's in my mind. So yes, it was a big part of my life. Um, I will always love that place and the people who live there, a uh, very particular kind of people hard-bitten, able to fix anything, a lot like Newfoundlanders. Um, if you ever have to be cast on a desert island, it's good to have either a Newfoundlander or a Wyoming person with you. <laughs> Though I'm sure that they don't give them out at the, <laughs> at the edge of the <laughs> railing. Um, yeah, great people. I learned a lot. I had many fine times. And now I'm in another place. And you've given us bark skins in the interim. Uh, really a tremendous um, sort of chronicle of the settling of North America. Uh, a big book, a, a, a book about uh, deforestation. It couldn't be more timely, this, this book. One of, the, one of your epigraphs um, is a quote I won't, I'm not going to read here, but basically it says, that when the conquest of America took place, we virtually destroyed the pagan animism. And in the process of destroying that pagan animism in which nature becomes very much alive and, 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 and is a character in your life, uh, you begin the erosion of a very deep respect, if not worship, of the natural world. And it's almost as if we've invited a curse upon ourselves. Uh, I find that really, really interesting, um, uh, compelling, and convincing uh, that we have, in a way, leaving that mythological uh, past that we've, co the connection that we've had with nature, that we have lost something profound. We never had it to lose. Mm. Uh, the people who settled, the settlers, adventurers from Europe and England, um, we did not have those animistic beliefs at the time that people began shifting to the new world. So this was, in, among other things, Barkskins was a contrast between two kinds of peoples, two kinds of thought, two kinds of world approach between um, Native Americans and the go-getter entrepreneurial types. Um, a complicated story, and uh, it's a big book, too big, but it was hard to make it smaller because if you're going to do forests, you're going to have to have time, and 300 years was the absolute minimum time 
that I could manage the rise and fall of um, a, a forest situation. And that means a lot of characters. Uh, so that was kind of a trap. I've often thought since then, how could I have made this a smaller book? My editor had a good idea about how to make it a smaller book. <laughs> <laughs> she had her red pencil, and we cut something like 150 pages from the original manuscript. Many that's that's of them, a deforestation uh, in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Many of those pages I was sad to see go, but um, probably people would not have been able to pick the book up. <laughs> but so it goes. Uh, it was an ambitious thing. I think I would have, the ending of it was a very much darker before I changed it at the end and gave a ray of hope. I still have that ray of hope, but uh, it's dimmer every day. Would you um, like to ask a question of Annie Peru? Please come forward to the, to the microphones. We'll have a little bit of time. Uh, I will ask a question, uh, Annie, while people do. Uh, please, please, I invite you to come up. Uh, if, when you ask a question, though, uh, it, lots of things don't last forever, but this does because it gets archived in the Library of Congress, and your question and the answer are going to be archived forever. So <laughs> choose well. Um, <laughs> Uh, Annie, y you, I think you mentioned last night that Barkskins is going to be a series made by National Geographic. The, you have had, a, a, apart from a life in words and in print, you have uh, now films, and uh, these, th this writing of yours is coming very much alive in a visual uh, mm -hmm. medium. There was a time when books were what it was all about, storytelling and um, imagination in this country, but it's not like that now. Film is dominant. Um, television serials are dominant. Some people get around to actually reading the books of a film that they've seen and liked or been, or been provoked by. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's nonsensical to avoid film under the impression that you're being a, some kind of purist. So I have been involved in and am involved in uh, various film ventures. Yes, uh, National Geographic did option bark skins to be made into a series. Um, I don't know where the project is right now, and like these things, perhaps it'll come to nothing. Um, I have read some of the early sections and been in contact with the writer. Haven't heard anything for about six months, so I have no idea. Um, so some of the Wyoming stories are being looked at with fresh eyes by filmmakers. And I'm involved in um, books that I haven't written, but that I know something about because I read them and enjoyed them so deeply. And um, on and on it goes. There's a connection with uh, museums, uh, exhibits, film people, television people, and so forth. It's part of today's writing world. You can't be a hermit as attractive as that is, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't really work. Yes, indeed. Question here. Good morning. You mentioned that you are in the Pacific Northwest now, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what inspiration you're finding there. I Thank am you. living in the Pacific Northwest now, and as for inspiration, it's all around. Um, it's a beautiful part of the country. I've got the Olympic Range to the west, the Cascades to the east, um, British Columbia to the north, Oregon to the south, and it's a mild climate. The ocean is there, Puget Sound is there, seaweed, sea lions, seals, fish, crabs, wind, rain, interesting people, 
it's a very um, engaging place, and I'm um, learning about it, trying to learn some seaweeds right now and about the indigenous people. Many of the tribes uh, remained um, their own selves. They weren't shuffled off somewhere, and they still are very viable. Anybody who makes it out there should go to Cape Flattery and Nia Bay up at the tip of the peninsula and see the extraordinary Macaw Cultural Center, which will teach you a great deal about life as it was before white people came. The Macaw Museum, the cultural center, is the result of something that happened 500 years ago. A fishing village of Macaw people were sleeping happily when a landslide, landslide came down and covered their village entirely. Beginning in the late 70s, it was noticed that the sea was eroding some of the pile of dirt and artifacts were appearing. Um, archaeologists came and after a while, all of the people in, um, in the Macaw tribe were engaged in helping puzzle out what these artifacts were, how they were used, plans were made for a museum. The work went on for years, and the result today is extraordinary. This entire village was preserved in, in every tiny detail, and you can see the unfolding of those lives and how life was lived 500 years ago in that museum. I think it's one of the most striking and powerful museums I've ever been in. So, when you all come out to the Olympic Peninsula, uh, be sure to go out there to Cape Flattery and um, visit the Macaw Cultural Center. That's, that's only part of what's there. It's, it's a rich, rich place with a rainforest. With, I can look out my kitchen window and see those things that look like the... Does anybody remember when the semis used to go up and down the highways with big crates of chickens stacked up on them, <laughs> feathers blowing around? Well, the cruise ships remind me very much of those, <laughs> of, those um, <laughs> of those old semis. They don't carry chickens around that way anymore, but uh, the cruise ships are still there. <laughs> My timekeeper says we have time for one more question, so. I'm sorry, I've been talking too much. No, we love it. Yeah, that's why we're here. Please. Uh, yes, uh, you, you talked about the importance of place and, and how it affects who we are. And uh, it seems to me right now we're uh, experiencing a mass migration from areas of conflict and poverty, people moving within our country as well to uh, get a better job or whatever. So what, what effect is this going to have on the human psyche if we lose our sense of place? Will it be a global sense of place rather than individual? Thank you. That is a question. Yeah. <laughs> Cancel the rest of the day. <laughs> um, I'm extremely interested in migration right now. I had, I had the huge pleasure of writing um, a foreword for a Wyoming uh, project on ungulate migration in, in, the, uh, in the state of Wyoming. Um, recently, uh, I think it's coming out in a month or so, but human migration, animal migration, bird migration, butterfly migration, everything is in motion. And one of the directions that scientific studies are taking now is in the direction of trying to understand that everything is moving. I mean, we, live, we live on these chunks of rock that are shifting around the world. We live next to shores where tides are changing and increasing. We live in so much motion and change that that's where it's all happening. And I'm utterly intrigued. Um, this is my keen, one of my keen interests right now about migration, human migrations. I have zero answers. I'm still learning, I think, like the rest of us. So I can't really give you any kind of coherent answer there, except to say, I want to know more. 
Well, your coherent answer will, I'm sure, come in your, in your next work, which we all look forward to. Annie, congratulations for being the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction winner. Sometimes you have to have a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.